afternoon all. My name is Melissa Moore, PSL for Local Government and Property at LexisNexis. I'm delighted to welcome you to this LexisNexis Local Authority Insight Series, brought to you in association with local government lawyers. With all that said, I'm delighted to welcome today's panellists. Ruth Stockley is a barrister at King's Chambers. She specialises in all aspects of town and country planning, environmental law, compulsory purchase, highways, road traffic regulation, taxi licensing, village greens and judicial review. She regularly advises and acts for developers, landowners and local authorities, with extensive experience in appearing in planning inquiries. She also frequently appears in the courts at all levels and in various tribunals, including the Upper Tribunal Lands Chamber on compensation issues and the First Tier Tribunal relating to listing of assets of community value. She also appears in the Traffic Penalty Tribunal on traffic regulation. Ruth has particular expertise in highways law and has been an editor of the Highway Law and Practice Encyclopedia for over 25 years. She's widely regarded as one of the UK's leading authorities on highways matters. Our second panellist is Chris Burgess, who's a senior lawyer at Norfolk County Council, which he joined in September 2021, working with the planning and environmental team. Chris has spent considerable time working in-house in local government, government, both at district and county council level. He's also spent nine years working in the national planning team of a major international law firm. In addition to being a qualified solicitor, Chris is a legal associate of the RTPI and has written articles and delivered speeches at conferences on topical planning law issues. Chris specialises in all aspects of planning and highways, law, common land and compulsory purchase. On behalf of everyone attending today, thank you both. And over to you, Ruth and Chris. OK, well, um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, uh, it, my name is uh, Chris Burgess. I'm a, a senior lawyer at, um, at Norfolk County Council. Um, I've been a highways lawyer for, for many, many years. Um, and uh, I'm glad so many of you can join us today. So the way this is going to work, Ruth and I are just going to have a, a sort of like a formal, informal chat about uh, some of the topics um, that are in the in the webinar. And I'm going to ask um, uh, Ruth uh, to, um, uh, to to give us some legal views on on potential court challenges. Uh, I just want to start this with a with an interesting uh, anecdote. I a few years ago I was at a Christmas dinner. And um, they kept the chair free next to me for an important guest. And it was a former Secretary of State for Transport who sat down. I then used that probably as a, an opportunity to ask, ask that uh, Secretary of State why we never had an integrated transport policy back in the 80s and the 90s. Um, the reply I got was, well, it's so difficult to get people out of their cars. Um, and so obviously that's the sort of setting the scene now, really, as to going forward, making highways fit for purpose. Um, I think the uh, the non uh, sort of ve electrical vehicles and uh, the hybrids and that of the future are going to be sort of outlawed very much so. Um, and I think obviously we've got to look at how we make highways fit for purpose. So um, I, I'm a keen cyclist, Ruth. Um, I go into work on my bike when I can. Um, so, so what can you do for me under under the highway legislation? Yeah, so a good start to return, Chris, and you're very sustainable, so yes, good on you for that. Um, in terms then of cyclists, just, just bringing this right back to, to what, what the intention is, which is to get us to the net zero carbon by 2050. Um, it is fair to say, as you've mentioned, that there have been attempts for many, many years to get people out of the private car, more walking, more cycling, more public transport, but it's really come to a head now. And just to answer your question directly, I think there are two main tools available to authorities for cyclists. Firstly, one shouldn't forget the general powers in the Highways Act, so in Section 6 of the Highways Act, it is open to an authority to create a cycle track that's within, as, as part of an existing carriageway. So that power is available without any 
order being made, and that shouldn't be forgotten. But aside from that, I think the main tool available to authorities, not just for cyclists, but also to increase walking, to reduce reliance on the private car, is of course the traffic regulation order made on the Road Traffic Regulation Act 1984. And I think, well, they're already very, very widely used, but I think these orders are going to become a lot more frequently used in practice. And they are extremely flexible. So they can be used to control part of a road, not just the whole width. They can be used to restrict all types of traffic, pedestrians, cyclists, uh, motor vehicles, and all classes of vehicles. So you could even have, for example, a road that was prohibited to all vehicular traffic, save electric vehicles. You could have a road that's open to all, open to no vehicular traffic, save public transport vehicles. And there are all sorts of flexible uh, ways and means by which different objectives can be achieved to restrict and control traffic. And of course, to impose exceptions in any of these orders. So I see the traffic regulation orders are very, very valuable and likely to be even more widely used too to achieve these, these current um, objectives and hopefully to help you, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and the other thing, presumably, um, Ruth, with these things, with these traffic orders, people get very emotive about them, don't they? And they're likely to challenge them, aren't they? True. Um, and so I suppose you would emphasise um, good consultation, wouldn't you, on these things? Because Indeed. that must be a real um, productive ground for challenge. Yeah, indeed, Chris. And to be honest, challenges are relatively frequent, I find, in these traffic regulation orders. Yes, consultation is vitally important. So compliance with the 1996 procedural regulations, if there is not proper consultation, that is a fundamental ground of challenge, which is regularly successful in practice. But I think it's also important from an authority's point of view to keep your traffic regulation orders hopefully free from statutory challenge is always to ensure three points. One, as Chris has already said, comply with the correct procedures. Two, ensure that you satisfy the statutory criteria for whatever power you're using. If you're making an experimental order or a temporary order or a permanent order. And three, crucially important, is to comply with all the statutory duties that are imposed when, when one makes a traffic regulation order. So there are the duties under 122 of the Road Traffic Regulation Act to keep traffic free, mo uh, free moving, safe, etc., but taking on board all the other criteria. That's similar to the Section 16 traffic management app duty but also don't forget and this seems to be the go-to ground of challenge at the moment the public sector equality duty it's vital that when a TRO is made you consider that particular duty and demonstrate it has been considered as part of the process by referring to it ideally in the committee reports etc so as long as those three are, are complied with, the statutory criteria, the, those duties and the procedural regulations, that's how you generally ensure that your order, traffic regulation order will be free, hopefully, from successful statutory challenge. That's really great. Thanks, um, Ruth. I, I'm, I'm aware from the chat um, online that uh, some people having trouble uh, hearing this. I mean, apologies to that. Apologies for that. Obviously, it's a technical problem. I think some people can hear us and others say they haven't got good quality sound. Um, yeah. So again, apologies to, to you who are uh, experiencing that. We, we will soldier on um, regardless. Um, the, the thing I'd just like to talk about now, Ruth, is, is electric vehicles. Um, yes, that would be very that. helpful. Yeah, because they're obviously a really important component of the, the, the net zero um, objective, yes. So, so what I thought I'd do on electric vehicles is to look at the legal um, perspective of that, and, I, and I've broken that down into to planning the planning position, um, a building regs, highways law, and 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 property issues. Um, j just going to the planning position, there are permitted development rights in the general permitted development order of 2015. Um, which enable you to um, to to, um, to add in a, a charge points into buildings without getting 
planning permission. Um, just as an interesting historic aside on the permit development order, um, the first order was made in 1948 and it was 17 pages long. <laughs> <laughs> the current order, which is 2015, I think runs to about um, over 250 pages. Uh, and that's obviously um, a, a real issue because it's got so complicated now with um, permitted development rights. Uh, and it's often, you know, often people don't understand how they work. Um, sadly, even sometimes the professionals are, are scratching their heads. So, but certainly under, under the um, permit development order of 2015, there are permitted development rights to to uh, add in um, charging points uh, into buildings and that without requiring planning permission. Uh, the next issue to look at is building regs. Uh, I think the government has in that last year announced that um, the new um, electric vehicle charging requirements will come into force in the building regulations. And there is the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities has published statutory guidance, approved document S for anyone who's interested in looking at that. And that's all about incorporating in, in new buildings and residential buildings undergoing undergoing a new major renovation um, and non-residential buildings undergoing, undergoing a new major renovation to add in electric charging points into that. Um, so obviously, government is keen to see charging points being provided uh, so just going on to highways law. So so the issue we've got is um, if someone wants to put a cable from their house across the highway to to their parking place and plug it in, what uh, what how does how, where what what's the implications of that from a highway authority's point of view? So I looked at um, section fifty, Ruth, which is Streetworks licences, yeah. um, which seems to be Streetworks Act. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which which seems to um, have been adopted by some authorities, uh, which allows them to grant a streetworks license to retain apparatus in the street. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then we've got the other thing that seems to be um, relevant is the Section 162 of the Highways Act, which is this restriction about placing a rope, etc., other apparatus across, across the highway. Uh, and then the other power is Section 178, which is, um, I'll just cite uh, very quickly what that says. No person shall fix or place any overhead beam, rail pipe, cable, wire, other, other similar apparatus over, along or across the highway without the consent of the highway for, um, that, for that highway. So, so really, Ruth, I, I think there's very little case law on, on this at the moment because it's such a new area of law. But from your background as um, the co-editor of Highways Encyclopedia, <laughs> Um, in terms of those sections, um, I, I know some authorities are using those sections to authorise uh, the use of these cables across the highway. What, what, what's your what's your opinion on that in terms of the liability for highway authority um, uh, and also the way it needs to be approved? Yeah, I think ultimately, as you're saying, Chris, the starting point is the authority has to have the statutory power to put any cables across a highway because that's tantamount to an obstruction of the highway and similarly to break into the highway a requisite power is is needed for that so i think you're right that the, the provisions you pointed to uh, i feel would ought to be sufficient to enable the the cables to be laid but having said that i anticipate that there will be further legislation um, that will be passed in due course, particularly statutory instruments, uh, but maybe further primary legislation that will give more express powers, I think, for authorities to do these works in due course when these electric vehicles become, become so much more common. So I am anticipating more, but as you say at the moment, there's no case law that I'm aware of on, on the, the particular issue. That's really helpful. Thanks, Ruth. And just to finish on that particular point, um, uh, on a, from a property point of view, obviously, if you're going to, um, the cable is going to be laid across someone else's land, then obviously you're going to have to think about rights and easements to do that. So, um, okay, well, I think I think that's really all I want to say on, a, on electric vehicles. It's it's obviously, just to, just to sum up what I've just mentioned, it's going to be part of the building regs regime going forward. 
there are existing planning permit development rights um, to enable you to, in, uh, to to put in charging points. And under highways law, there are powers that some authorities are already using, particularly the ones I cited, um, to, to license that. Um, OK, I think that's sort of really, uh, I, I'm just conscious that we've got uh, quite a lot to talk about today. So I don't really want to spend too much time on on just one sort of area. Um, perhaps I can just mention clean air zones um, and then um, uh, sort of move on, you know, j just just to explain the whole purpose of clean air zones. So, so in May last year, in May 2017, the, gublish, the government published the clean air zone framework for England. Uh, and this ties in very much now with the uh, Environment Act that was passed in last year about the need for air quality uh, and I think what the government's intention is that um, that they will encourage local authorities to create more clean air zones within their within their administrative areas. Um, and, there, and sadly, there's been a number of recent high profile cases reported of people who have died for asthma and stuff like that, which probably can be attributable to the uh, the carbon dioxide um, and, and other bits of nitri nitrous oxide that um, um, from vehicle emissions and stuff like that. So the framework is that the government intend to produce these, um, encourage local authorities to set up these clean air, zone, clean air zones. Uh, I just wanted to sort of mention on that point from a planning perspective, I'm, I'm aware of a case um, which I'm just going to cite here. It was a 2019 case. Uh, it was, it's our on the application of Shirley v Secretary of State for housing communities and local government. Um, it's a court of appeal decision in which they rejected an appeal by a local residence against the High Court's dismissal of an application to judicially review the Secretary of State's decision not to call in an application for housing development in Canterbury and Kent. The appellant claimed that the Secretary of State had wide obligations under the Air Quality Directive to use calling powers to review the local planning authority's proposal to grant planning permission for the development because it might significantly impact on local levels of nitrogen dioxide. The Court of Appeal disagreed and upheld the, court, the High Court's decision. Um, and importantly, the Court said the Secretary of State has no general duty under the air quality legislation to use their planning powers to avoid the worsening or prolongation, a prolongation of breaches of air quality limit value. So that's the only case I'm, I'm currently aware of. But I, I suspect it's a case of, um, of watch this space with, uh, with air quality and with, um, uh, with these clean air zones because uh, I can imagine they become, they're going to become more topical. As we know, Ruth, um, there are lots of uh, special interest groups out there who are very interested in terms of um, in terms of that. So that that sort of really uh, brings me on brings me on to the final thing I just maybe want to mention uh, in in this um, seminar is, is is local transport plans um, and how they can be used to make highways fit for for purpose. Uh, and I'm aware under the Transport Act of 2000, there is an obligation uh, that's been around since 2000 for local transport authorities uh, to um, produce local transport plans, which is made up of part policy and part um, implementation plans. Uh, last year, I think the government following the Glasgow summit decided to issue um, a ministerial guidance, which said that uh, you have to take into account in your local transport plan decarbonisation targets but rather helpfully they haven't issued any further guidance on that so I don't know whether you uh, in your day-to-day -day practice Ruth whether you've got um, any idea when they might issue some guidance or something I mean I think we were promised this year but it is a bit like how, how long is a piece of string because whenever I give a, a, an estimate as to when something's likely to come in it never does despite the promises. I, like you, Chris, I've heard it's imminent, but I, I have no firm indication as to when. It is a case of watch this space with that. I, I think I think the problem's going to come, isn't it? There are, there are an awful lot of people out there who don't think that we should be building any more new roads because yeah. I think it's going to be hard to deliver a completely carbon-free road, isn't it, in terms of emissions. So I think the, this area is obviously another area of, of potential challenge, isn't it? It is. It is indeed. And I, I think ultimately one has to look at areas, areas for the, for the clean, clean air zones, etc. 
uh, and select particular streets or particular areas that should become low traffic uh, networks, etc. But of course, linking that back to TROs, the, the uh, air quality is a specific ground on which a traffic regulation order can ma be made. So that in itself is a perfectly proper purpose to make an order under Section 1 of the Road Traffic Regulation Act. So it really ties it all together. And I think another point I'd like to mention going forward, now you're talking about timescales, Chris, but when things will come in. I've been here before, but I understand that this year, finally, um, the moving traffic offences um, enforcement provisions are coming into force to enable um, authorities outside London. It's already in force in London and in Wales, but outside London, uh, the all other English authorities are going to have those powers now to enforce the moving traffic um, offences set out in the Traffic Management Act of 2004. So th these kind of TROs we're talking about, restricting, prohibiting traffic from certain streets, um, pedestrianisation, one-way streets, etc., they hopefully will soon be able to be uh, enforced by authorities in the same way as parking contraventions. The authorities, you, you have to make an application to become a civil enforcement area for those offences. Um, and then they can be enforced in the same way as, as parking contraventions by virtue of a penalty charge notice and ultimately an appeal to the Traffic Penalty Tribunal. And I suspect there will be a wide take up of that from authorities because at the moment these are, these contraventions are reliant on the police to enforce and it's one thing getting all your TROs in place, getting them valid, getting them properly signed, but they still have to be enforced to be effective. So I think that's something to keep, keep an eye on because I do think it is imminent, really do, this time um, and hopefully that will give some further a further tool available to authorities to directly enforce it, these orders themselves. Um, that, that's very helpful, Ruth. I'm sorry, I've just seen in the chat that somebody um, asked to me to just repeat those those right. um, those statutory powers. Um, Section 50 was a street works licence. That's um, the Roads and Street Works Act, isn't it? Yeah, 162 and 178 uh, were, were the two powers that we were we were looking at. So. Um, yeah, that's that's very um, very interesting. So thanks for that on that. So um, just just moving forward, can I just ask you just sort of a general overview and your knowledge of the highway legislation? I mean, would you would you think the Highway Act has really kept up to uh, kept up pace with with the, with the requirements of modern society in terms of? I mean, it's 1980, isn't it? It's an it's an old piece of legislation. Um, but um, do you think it needs to sort of maybe have some uh, sort of amendments really brought in to deal with, with with the way we want to where we want to be in terms of highways fit for purpose for the future uh, that's a really good question chris uh, i think the answer has to be yes uh, and you say it's 1980 of course the 1980 act is largely a consolidation act from the highways act 1959 and some of the legislation we still rely on is the highway act 1835 so, no, I don't think it has kept up to date. I think there needs to be some very significant amendments to it. And perhaps I can just give an example. I'll do one of my my little anecdote, Chris. Um, re and I think this is showing where the future is going. I'm recent, I've recently had to advise um, on the concept of robotic deliveries by way of robots on the footway, going from co-ops, Tesco, Sainsbury's, etc., to and they're automated, but totally net zero uh, emissions, carbon free, and delivering to individuals. Um, apparently, this is taking place in Milton Keynes, where they have it's been a new town. They have segregated areas, but it's wanted to be done wider now on the footway. And of course, then one goes back to the 1835 Highway Act, which makes it a criminal offence for any mechanically propelled vehicle to use the footway. There are exceptions, such as using the words of the Act, invalid carriages, and hence the motorised um, mobility scooters fall within that exception. But this concept clearly wouldn't. 
And if it is going to come about, and in a way that this is the future to, to take more vehicles off the road, online deliveries are becoming more frequent. It's happening in the States. They've got it in Milton Keynes. And I think that's just a, another example of where the legislation needs to be amended to have further exceptions for concepts of this nature. But on a more generalised basis, there needs to be much more now coming forward in terms of the, the electric vehicles, as you said, the infrastructure required for that. But I do think we will see a raft of new legislation. It may not be amendments to the Highways Act, it may be freestanding legislation, but there certainly needs to be some changes made. And to the Road Traffic Regulation Act of 84, because there were problems during COVID trying to implement the guidance but then to do it under the existing powers and authorities were using temporary orders to widen footways to make them safe for pedest safer from pedestrians. But to do that for air quality reasons, you couldn't do because under Section 14, you can only make a temporary TRO outside London um, for, for uh, if, if it is preventing a danger to the public or damage to the highway. So all these kinds of, of strict limitations on the statutory powers, I think they need to be extended and will be extended, hopefully in the not too distant future. Thanks, Ruth. That's really interesting. We've we got a question. I don't know whether you can help on this. It says, will, will TAs need express powers to enforce moving traffic offences, even if they have enforcement powers under the TMA for parking? That's a really good question. Yeah, my understanding is you would have to have a separate authorization to enforce the um, moving traffic offences. So if you're a civil enforcement area for parking, I think that the, the order that governs that enables you to enforce the specific parking contraventions. But my understanding is you would need to go through a separate but very similar process to get a similar order in, in order to enable you to civilly enforce the moving traffic offences that are set out in, in the schedule to the 2004 Act. That's really helpful. Thanks, Ruth. I just, can we just develop um, something a bit more that's mentioned? This thing, low, lower speed limits. I think that the idea is that um, if we reduce speed limits, I know there's a, there's a school of thought that says if you reduce speed limits on roads, you reduce accident rates. Um, and also you potentially reduce um, uh, sort of carbon emissions of that. I mean, I know I know you can use TROs for that sort of thing again. Have you any thoughts on, on, on the merits of that in terms of making highways fit for purpose for the future? Yeah, I, I think this is, again, a way forward that is currently being actively considered. Um, I, certainly the, the thought process is that particularly in residential areas and city and town centres, to reduce the speed limit will be appropriate so that not only it be safer, but there will be less carbon emissions. Um, at the moment, I'm, I'm advising a few Welsh authorities because in Wales, the, the um, National Assembly are currently looking to make the default speed limit 20 miles per hour in residential areas rather than the current 30 miles per hour per hour so there is there are, there are the moment that they are going through that process it's already in Scotland in certain areas and it may be in England that we start to reduce more areas to a 20 mile per hour limit more as the default rather than 30 um, but in any event one can make um, traffic orders in relation to speed limits now even for individual areas individual roads it has to be made under Section 84 of the Road Traffic Regulation Act, so it's not strictly a traffic regulation order, but it's a traffic order. I think the important point to note, the two points to note there, though, would be, one, that you can't make an experimental uh, speed limit order, save, save within London. So outside London, you'd have to make a permanent order or a temporary order under Section 14 for danger reasons. And the second point is enforcement, not only is currently by the police, but that would remain because the Traffic Management Act moving offences list, which can become civilly enforceable, hopefully in due course, does not list speeding matters. 
So speeding offences would remain enforceable by the police. But I do think that's another tool available to authorities to seek to get these emissions down and hopefully to get, get us nearer to the uh, net zero carbon emissions. Thank you. That's very comprehensive. Um, I mean, the, the other thing that um, I know that some authorities are looking at are, are local traffic neighbourhoods and that to um, mm. uh, to actually try and reduce traffic. And also this has become quite uh, endemic, hasn't it, with um, with the COVID and that. And, I, and I've seen in my own uh, city I live, uh, restaurants want to put their chairs and their tables further out onto the highway to put barriers around them to encourage um, social distancing and all that sort of thing uh, and I think there is there is legislation I think the current legislation allows the highway authority to to license that sort of thing uh, mm. and, the, and the other thing is about um, there's been a number of challenges I'm aware of in London and that about people wanting to put bollards to stop certain types of traffic coming in and there was um there is one uh, a fairly high profile case, I think it involved the Taxi Driver Association in London challenging a decision um, to actually to bring in some of these plans because they felt they'd been unfairly discriminated against. Uh, yeah. Have you any thoughts about that for, for our for our audiences about how you can get these things through and, and limit the reduce of a potential successful legal challenge? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's so on point, Chris, this. Yeah, the, these low traffic neighbourhoods, they're particularly common in London. They have been for some time. London has, has been putting these forward, but they're now becoming more widespread. Um, and, and again, it's very much based on traffic regulation orders being made to keep the traffic down in these residential areas. I think my views, first two points. Firstly, on the point of low traffic neighbourhoods generally, if you're talking about a neighbourhood rather than individual streets, I think it's it's par it's absolutely imperative that there's extensive consultation because these kind of orders, as you say, Chris, they do raise a lot of challenge over a widespread area. So, sorry, sorry, Ruth, can I just interrupt? Because that that's yeah. very on point. Because we just had a question in. Can you please provide more detail how consultations could be should be conducted? to avoid legal challenges being upheld. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, but what That's you're just saying point. is really topical. Good point. Yes, remind me to come back. That's a really good point because, as you mentioned earlier, Chris, uh, failure to properly consult is a highly has a high success rate of challenge. The crucial point is to comply with the 1996 regulations, and that sets out specific bodies who have to be consulted for any traffic regulation order or traffic order in London and also sets out publication requirements to, to, to those affected and we're putting notices in the press on council website etc. So you go to those regulations, I think it's six and seven of the 96 regulations and comply with those. The real problem arises obviously where there's not compliance with those regs, but where surprisingly, where authorities consult wider than is required, they go beyond the statutory requirements. And the problem then is that can raise a legitimate expectation that for another order, a future order, the authority will take that stance. And if you go wider and say, right, we will notify individuals in street A, then that gives residents in street, in street B a ground to say, well, hang on, if they were consulted, why weren't we? And the regulations give you that tightness, as it were. It gives you, it says, those are the limits, that's all you have to do. Once you go wider, you're getting into difficulties. So you must always avoid creating a legitimate expectation, if possible. And my advice from what's happened in the past with others, I would always say, comply with the regs and as long as you comply with the regs don't create a legitimate expectation and that's the safest way to ensure that your um your, your orders are watertight but then of course the other big point once you have consulted you must then take those consultation responses into account it's no good saying that we've consulted we can carry on you must actively take them into account and you must have consulted before you finalise the order. So it has to be, you have to be able to demonstrate, we did the proper consultation, we took it into account, you may have tweaked the, the particular order to reflect some of those 
concerns expressed. And as long as you demonstrate all that, again, preferably in a committee report, then you should be watertight on a consultation, any consultation round of challenge. But it is very important, good question that, to make sure there's proper consultation. I've just got, a, I've just seen another question on the chat. I don't know whether you can help on this one, Ruth. It says, do bollards need to be part of the TRO? <laughs> or can you rely on Section 92 of the Road Traffic Regulation Act separately? Yes, they wouldn't. They wouldn't be. No, they wouldn't be part of the TRO itself. No, that's dealing with the restrictions on on the traffic. What what then would happen is once the traffic regulation order is made and and it's when it takes effect, at that point you are in, obviously you have to sign it and you have to create the physical requirements needed to reflect the TRO. And as I said, yes, Section 92 is available. So you have the powers then to put in the appropriate bollards. So you wouldn't do that as part of the wording of the TRO, but you'd rely on your powers to put those bollards on the highway once, you, once you've got your TRO made and obviously before it takes effect. Thanks, Ruth. That's really, really informative. Another comment from one of our participants is, is there evidence to support some argument that lowering speed limits to 20 mile hours would reduce the carbon emissions or CO2 um, from road emissions? Well, I, I, I don't know whether any scientific research has been done on this because um, I suspect that lowering speed limits is also about reducing accidents, isn't it? I mean, I don't know really, any of you remember that dreadful um, there was a, a road safety film years ago and it showed a little girl walking across the road and getting hit and then she falls against the tree and it was all about, it was based on a true story apparently and it was all about if you drive at 30 or 20 in a, in a built up area and if you do hit someone you're less likely to kill them than if you're doing a, doing a higher speed. So I suspect that the 20 mile speed thing is very much um to uh, uh you know very much um, about um, reducing accidents and 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 uh, as much about carbon reducing carbon emissions as well so um but um okay that's um that's that's really useful so 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 mm. thank you for that um I, I just perhaps just want to mention that um that uh case in uh, it, i think it was it's mm -hmm. our, it's our on the application of united trade action route limited v, v tfl v transport for london uh, it was it was a high court decision um, which was overturned by the Court of Appeal, um, and, and you're right because the, the grounds of challenge were irrationality. Um, the judge had given no weight to the impact of congestion on public transport, failure to have regard to material considerations, and failure to comply with the public sector equality duty. Uh, so, so just on a wider note, and I know that our local authority participants would be, would be interested in this. I mean, I haven't been a planning lawyer for many years. Um, I, I've, I've often done a, a lot of stuff on uh, on decision making and planning. And I suppose that that principle applies to local government generally, also to to highways as well. And, and my, my view, viewpoint always was that uh, how much weight to give to a material consideration is a matter very much for the decision maker. Um, whether it's a material consideration is very much um, the courts will then decide whether you sh whether something is, is is a matter of a material consideration for for law, but the weight you give to it is very much a, a matter for the decision maker. So in terms of the discussion we've just had on the consultation for these things, uh, provided you take them into account, you're perfectly legitimate to to disregard them, aren't you? If you've taken them into account and you're consulted. Um, you can give them very, very little or no weight unless there's some legal case law or principle that says you have to give them more weight. Um, do, what, what's your views on that? I mean, do, do you still think that the courts would be reluctant to, to put on the hat of the decision maker and decide what should have been the outcome? Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Chris. Yeah, the, the crucial point is to take into account all the material considerations, but the amount of weight attributed to them is for the decision maker. The important point is to balance then all the material considerations. And I think that case is also important because it, it demonstrates the importance of considering all the requirements of all the road users. So in that case, there were bus lanes put in and the hackney carriages, not the private hire, the, the taxis 
public uh, taxes were not being entitled to use those buzz lanes and hence they were complaining and bringing the challenge because they wanted to be to be able to use these lanes and they brought in the public sector equality duty because they were set, they were arguing well we convey a lot of disabled people who rely on our taxes uh, and you're discriminating against them and not complying with the duty but interestingly, although in the High Court, Mrs Justice Lang upheld the claim, the Court of Appeal did dismiss it because it was satisfied, exactly your point, Chris, that all these points had been taken into account by the authorities, they, TFL, I think, they'd been, um, they'd been balanced and a rational decision had been reached. And it's for the decision maker to apply the appropriate weight and to do that balancing exercise. So the crucial point is balance everything, take everything on board. But how you do that balance, obviously to do it reasonably, is for the authority. And the courts do, they do uphold that very much so. They do leave the ultimate decision for the authority as long as you have taken all relevant matters into account and can demonstrate that you have done so by reference, as I say, in the committee reports, etc. Yeah, that's a very useful sort of um, reinstatement of, of the current principles. I mean, I think sometimes forgotten that uh, when you're doing these things, it's easy to miss miss some um, certain important points. And I think it's good for, for all um, local authorities to keep a, a checklist. I, I'm a great believer in checklists to, to, to say you've ticked those boxes and you make certain you catch up um, and, and you make certain you don't miss anything. So it's just a matter of procedure. I mean, just interesting as well. I think I'm right in thinking that this year, that in January, we had a new um, highway code uh, coming in, which has given preference again, more preference to cyclists, I understand. Oh. Um, again, again, I know there are some people, maybe in the audience, that aren't. That aren't um, uh, I, I don't say cycle, cycle orientated, but it's just interesting because I know a lot of people uh, are reluctant to get to the roads and cycle on the roads, and that's families and it's it's everybody because of the safety aspect of that. And we've explored already um, in terms of the powers they have to do this, in terms of the of the available powers to create more cycling more cycle roads and it's almost like whether it's not just the legal aspect is whether there is the will to do it because I, I was aware at a conference I was several years ago and a gentleman from uh, from Holland came and said that in Holland uh, they encourage their, I don't know if this is true or not, but he said in Holland they encourage people to cycle to work by giving them an extra incentive for their pay packet so so if you cycle to work you get sort of an extra bit to encourage people to, to do cycling so it's not all about just the law isn't it it's about there's there's the stick and the carrot a, a process in a lot of these things and, and yeah. too often we go we go down the stick route um i, I know that um if you look at um uh, congestion charging is, is a classic one isn't it um some of the cities and that are now having london's obviously widening their congestion charging uh, zones and things like that but you often have to think about the residents who live in there uh, because obviously they're entering the congestion charge all the time. So I, I'm hoping that, that the, uh, the, tra the traffic authorities make allowance if you actually live, live in those areas. But I mean, it, just, just a general point, really, um, you know, it's just, just wider than the law. Um, do you have any sort of pre preference for, for, the, for the stick or the carrot approach for these <laughs> things? You know? I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Ruth, but I just think yeah, sometimes we're we too often to go for the stick approach, aren't we, as, as lawyers, you know? I think lawyers do. I think lawyers do. I agree that, that I think this is all dependent on lifestyle changes as well. It's got yeah. to be individuals. I think what authorities can do is to create the opportunities for people to make those changes and by making it safer for pedestrians and cyclists, more pleasant for pedestrians and cyclists, they are creating that opportunity for that to take place. I'm not sure about increasing pay packets. I don't think that would work. But I agree with you. I think we've got to create the opportunities and encourage people to make these lifestyle changes. And it's all these tools taken together, the clean zone areas, the, the traffic regulation orders, ex, all have to, the electric vehicles, et cetera, and provision for infrastructure for those, that all has to be brought, to, brought together and hopefully using all those t available tools and enforcement of all that. So there is still the important role of the stick, I think. It's only in that way that we can get anywhere near achieving this objective.
I, I just want to update you, Ruth, on some a couple of yes. comments again from our from our um, audience uh, in the chat. Um, uh, one one uh, person has said uh, in terms of that um, that case we talked about is this is this is there a case which shows a good example of how competing factors was weighed by the decision maker? And then and then going on to the discussion we just had about the weight to be given as a matter of the decision maker. Um, the comment is, although weight is a matter for the decision maker, shouldn't the decision maker need to explain the reasoning for that weight given? Um, so it's almost like, um, you know, it's almost like you can imagine a committee report saying, well, we're going to give um, a substantial weight to the fact it's um, it's this or we're going to give little weight. To, I, I don't know whether that would be a good idea, because I think that would be. Um, possibly, this is just my own view. I think it might be a hostage to fortune. I'd be, I'd be interested yeah. in your views. Yeah, that, so. I think you see that more in planning. In planning reports, you, you often would see a different weight being attributed to different factors. You, I'm not, I don't regularly see it, and I don't, I agree with you. I don't think it should be done in my view for traffic regulation orders. Um, I think the important point is to show that you have given due weight to various factors. So, as long as you've taken them into account and that's reflected, to my mind, that would suffice. You do not have to identify how much weight is given to each factor, and it should come across in the, in the decision in any event. So, for example, the public sector equality duty, if if you are removing disabled parking spaces because you're pedestrianising an area, if you then say, but to reflect that, we will create additional disabled parking spaces in another area to compensate, there you've shown you've clearly taken that into account. Or if in other cases you would say, we, we reject that, but we take that argument on board but we feel it is overridden by safety implications or something else so I think you would show you take it into account by what you substantively do and say in the report rather than start going into we'll give substantial weight to that limited weight to that I think you just want to give it due weight uh, at these various factors and that should suffice and in terms of the a case the, the difficulty is that, that the court doesn't look at the weighting argument it just says has the authority got it wrong um but that there are, there are a series of decisions the trail the trail riders decisions hampshire and trail hampshire and trail riders that's a good example i think of where there was a balance um carried out and it was upheld by the court and interestingly that was a one two two duty and interestingly the court said as long as the substance of the, the balancing exercise is undertaken, that's all we need to know and, and, and be happy with. And as long as that's been done, we don't mind if you about saying specifically what we did. You just have to demonstrate substantively you've taken into account all the various interests and any consultation responses you get. So I think that's a good case. The Hampshire and Trail Riders is a good one showing the different the, the different way the ways the issues were weighed by the authority, which was then duly upheld by the court. That's really interesting, and, and I'm always fascinated by the by the workings of the judiciary. I, I remember a few years ago reading of a case where two opposing counsel were allowed to discuss the meaning of two words in a statute for ten days. Ten, ten days. Yes, Ruth, in a House of Lords case, and it was intentionally homeless. Was the two words. Exactly. And the and the law lords allowed this discussion to go on for ten days. Submissions on as to um, as to what was meant by intentionally homeless. Oh wow! Well, I hope I mean, that's, that's, that's probably an, that's probably an extreme example. Um, but um, you know that that's a whole area of a discussion in itself for those of us who have to do lots of court work as to how they come up with their judgments because i've i've read all sorts of interesting things about um about the judiciary and how uh, sometimes the minority decision is circulated and it may become the majority <laughs> decision if it's persuasive in terms of convincing those that are sitting on the fence um i just just want to just mention one other thing really which we probably want to talk about is how local authorities can uh, can set themselves as examples in terms of the stuff they buy themselves. I mean, I think it's Leeds City Council, and if there's anyone from Leeds here, I, I hope I got this right, have, have sort of in, uh, bought a whole fleet of electric vehicles, and it, it's this this sort of thing really about councils, obviously, are, are road users themselves. 
So maybe they can have as a procurement policy. Um, it's a bit like, um, uh, I shan't mention, but they are the world's biggest retailer and most of their vehicles are now electric. Um, and it's sort of the, these sort of things where they're trying to send out the right message that we're, we're a caring company and we do think about the environment. And the, and the other thing we haven't really touched upon is alternative fuels for things like, um, uh, you know, um, hydrogen and stuff like that, which is another possibility for, for people to use um, as, as an alternative. Um, uh, there's an interesting thing just come up in the chat that the DOT has some analysis on the 20 mile limit in the process and impact. Um, so I would hope that uh, government would be looking at this in terms of of this of this wish to um to bring the speed limits down to um to reduce the uh not just the accidents but also the the carbon things um just just as a sort of a general winding up really um on this ruth um, my understanding having having been involved in local government law for many many years is that we often have a lot of powers uh, as local authorities and the great beauty to me as a lawyer is that somewhere someplace there'll always be a historic power to do something, whether it's to put highway um, facilities on the side of the road, whether it's to deal with um, bathhouses, whether it's to deal with um, commons, and there's, there's all sorts of wonderful powers. And I, and I think there's a great reluctance, um, uh, particularly in, in compulsory purchase, which the local authorities were, were the drivers of that, um, to actually use those powers because they're always often worried about being challenged. And I know the well-being powers and the localism act and competency powers have all been brought in to encourage that and i do hope that going forward with with decarbonization that the authority authorities will be encouraged to, to look at those powers and to use them in a, in, a, in a in a creative way i don't know whether you've got any final thoughts on, on that um, from from a lawyer's perspective and obviously the concern is and from the participants is is actually um are we going to get challenged on this and how can we how can we reduce that and i know we've already touched on that have you any got any any takeaway points that, that people might be interested in on general general view? Yeah, as a t t final takeaway thought, I, the powers there are many many powers, but they're all over the place. It's unfortunate they're not all contained in one piece of legislation. They're in different pieces of legislation, and I think the important point is to always try to. to choose the correct power for what you are trying to do because it's vitally important for you not to be challenged that you comply with the particular statutory criteria of the particular power you are using. So it is important to select the right power. Do you want a TRO? If you do, do you want it permanent? Do you want it temperate? Do you want it experimental? Do you want to just exercise highway powers that don't require a TRO? Do you want to create um, uh, and a, and a, uh, um, an air quality area, control yeah. area, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You may want to do exercise a number of powers, but choose the correct one because you must demonstrate that you fulfil the relevant statutory criteria. But that's I hope really authorities will, will, will use these various powers. I think that's the idea. Use the various powers available to achieve the objectives you want to. Yeah, that's re really helpful because I think uh, sometimes lawyers um, can be, uh, I say, um, s s sort of seen as possibly putting forward solutions and that in terms of of how the uh, the, the powers could be used um, in, in, in the way they're intended. And I think that the worst thing I think from the public sector perspective is the reluctance to do things because you're frightened that you're going to be challenge and I've already mentioned the fact that if we look at the Stonehenge uh, challenges recently about the road that went past Stonehenge yes. um, it's, there is going to be uh, definitely uh, there, are, there are special interest groups out there who, are, who have, have formed the opinion which they're perfectly entitled to do so that that road building is not is not the way forward um, and we've got to do things to to reduce um, the amount of roads being built but then you have to look at the alternatives don't you and you have to think of of how do you encourage people not to use roads and it's going to be public transport yeah. it's going to be yes. uh, and, and hopefully working from home um you know remote working from home is going to dissuade people from having to actually go into the office as much as they used to do uh so but it's, it's really going to be a question of watch this space and I, and I for one um would be interested to see what the government's going to be saying on transport plans in terms of their guidance about how you actually produce plans that uh, encourage decarbonisation. So.
Yes, yeah, 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 def yes, definitely. I think there will a lot will happen in the next 12 months. I, I do. So it is a case of watch this space and then use those powers. Just just before we go, I want to finish with a funny story. Um, uh, I, watched the, I watched the thing about an American professor talking about a case in America where a gentleman bought 20 cigars and he decided to insure them against fire. Uh, and then he smoked them and then he claimed on his policy that all been damaged in fire. The insurers paid out, but then he was charged with 20 counts of arson. <laughs> That's a good story. <laughs> I'm not sure how it relates to highways, but it's a lovely story. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. I think um, we we sort of three minutes before one now. Thank you so much um, for covering so much ground in such a short time. I have one question here. Um, could you ask the speakers um, what year the Hampshire trial riders case was? So it was 2019 Court of Appeal, and the ref, for people who want the reference, it's 2019 EWCA 1275. Thank you so much. A useful judgment. A useful judgment. That yeah. Yeah, I've just posted that in the um in the in the chat function uh, for people. Thank you both so much and we hope everyone has enjoyed it and in due course the recording will come out. We're very sorry for those who've had um, audio problems or visual problems and we'll do our very best to um, clean it up before we send out the recording. Thank you so much Ruth, Chris. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Very thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.